This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 39. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey folks, welcome to session 39. You know, if you're anything like me, you've spent your professional career running away from the standard acceleration chart. You know, it was brought up in grad school a couple of times, and it just was one of those things that it was never really used all that much in the various places that have worked and things along those lines. And as such, I never really got into it. I've been aware over the years that there is this small contingent of behavior analysts who are very passionate about the use of the chart and precision teaching procedures more generally, but it just didn't seem like anything that was a fit for my purposes. Well, today's guest really helped to, I guess, uh, change my perspective on that, and it's a guest that has been recommended many, many times by lots of listeners, and it is none other than Rick Cabina from Penn State University and Chartlytics. So there may be some of you listening who are wondering, well, what the heck is Chartlytics? Well, aside from being a new sponsor to the Behavioral Observations podcast, Chartlytics is a single comprehensive system for behavior reduction and academic improvement through precision teaching. It's based on 50 plus years of peer reviewed research and experience in applied academic and behavioral settings. Chartlytics has modernized the science of PT by simplifying the data collection, visual analysis, and reporting processes, and it's fully automated and easy to use. As a matter of fact, one person I spoke with said, if you can use Facebook, you can use Chartlytics. It produces dramatic, rapid, and reliable results with elegant and simple visual displays. And, you know, frankly, who doesn't like elegant and simple visual displays, right? Um, Chartlytics offers an intensive two-day workshop on precision teaching and the standard acceleration chart at locations throughout the United States. As a matter of fact, I'll be attending one in Las Vegas in early December, and I'm really, really excited uh, to learn more about this. And uh, it's one of those things, I think, as we talk more about Chartlytics, it, it's almost like you guys will be kind of taking the journey uh, with me because, again, it's an area of practice that I'm relatively ignorant in, so I look forward to remediating that. So, uh, in, this, in these workshops, participants will learn how to supercharge their ABA programs using this powerful technology, which can often produce 10 times the change in targeted pinpointed behaviors. So, f- for more information, uh, check out chartlytics.com forward slash events. And if you want to learn more about precision teaching and standard acceleration charting, and you know if you're not able to make some of these events, uh, you can go to chartlytics.com forward slash Matt for an exclusive offer for listeners to this program. There's a whole uh, uh, professional development series. There's lots of CEs available uh, and things like that. So the folks at Chartlytics put together a nice package for listeners of the podcast with a great discount. So again, check out chartlytics.com forward slash Matt for more details. So uh, I think that's probably going to do it. Again, I want to keep these opening remarks a little bit brief because the interview itself is well over an hour. So without any further ado, please enjoy this discussion with Dr. Rick Cabina. Dr. Rick Cabina, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing. Thank you for having me tonight. Well, the pleasure's mine. And as you know, we have... Uh, kind of had this planned in the works for almost a year now. I think it was a year when we first had that initial Skype call and kind of like the, uh, I don't know if you caught the Pat McGreevy episode, the same thing happened with, with the interview I did with him. We had an, we had a kind of initial chat about a year ago and we just should have hit record then because it was, (laughs) my recollection was a pretty fun conversation and it would probably would have just fine. Um, and then certainly one thing led to another and here we are probably a year or so later, uh, and, uh, many, many listener requests between then and now asking you to come on the show, asking about, uh, standard acceleration and things like that, uh, precision teaching and whatnot. So, um, 
I'm glad that you're here uh, finally, and we're we're getting this done. Uh, I have to say that uh, out of all the people I've interviewed, I've been uh, particularly nervous about this episode because I have a confession to make. You've probably heard this from uh, a behavior analyst or two as you go about uh, preaching the good word of uh, precision teaching, but this is an area I know nothing about, Rick. I have heard that before, and it's understandable. All right. So, yeah, we talked about it a little bit in our lab meetings when I was a graduate student. Uh, we didn't use it in our research. It wasn't used in the uh, uh, various companies and agencies that I work for and things like that. Um, but I, I think the more and more I'm kind of meeting other behavior analysts and things like that, I'm, I'm bumping into people who do use it and do like it and things like that. Uh, and I think that, again, one of the things that has led me to kind of procrastinate kind of setting a date and actually doing this interview is me thinking like, okay, I'm going to come on this show and I'm going to look like an idiot. So, <laughs> um, but that's the, uh, that's the chance. I'm going to roll the dice and do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to ask all the so-called stupid questions and uh, we'll just uh, kind of lay it out from there. So, um, Well, let me say this. We are in our field. We're all scientists. And in science, it is a marketplace of ideas and when people come in contact with the good ideas they rise to the top and that's one thing that i've always found inviting and refreshing about our science so the fact that you're having me on and we're having this conversation is wonderful so i'm hoping tonight that i can share some information that like you said earlier, I've heard the story from many people where they'll say things like, well, you know, we never really covered it. Or the big thing that I hear a lot is, well, it's not on the exam, so I don't need to know about it. You know, so it's uh, it's great to get the conversation out there. And let me thank you in advance for what you do. Having this kind of podcast and sharing that information with everyone and giving people a platform to share these diverse ideas is exactly what science should be about. So it's a. I'm excited for the show tonight. Well, you were, thank you for what you're doing. Oh, that, that means a lot, Rick. Thank you very much. But uh, you know, it's important to point out that you were kind of a podcasting pioneer. Uh, so you you had the what was it the Precision Teaching Podcast? It was. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And how many shows did you end up doing with that? I probably did. Let me think. It actually started in 2007. And I had like one episode, and then I went to 2008, did a couple episodes, and I was very sporadic. And then after a while, I said, you know what? I need a partner. So I got a partner, and then that grew to partners. And at the high point, we were putting out one a month, so 11 shows. And then it tailed off in 2013. We probably had maybe 30-some episodes. And every now and then, people will ask me to start up another podcast and I say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, but I never do it. Yeah, well, you know, it's... Uh, it takes a lot of work, yeah, as you know. Yeah, it does, it does. It's one of those things you have to have the time to do it, and you have to really, really be into it to 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 be... Uh, uh, for the re re it's like the... End I tell people it's like an endless task analysis of, of you know, <laughs> of these little responses to, you know, produce a podcast. You know, there's a million different things you need to do. But in, in, in isolation, they're not all, all that difficult, but it's, you know, it's the, it's the getting them all done is the hard part. But uh, yeah, so you were kind of trailblazing back when, you know, no one really knew what a podcast was. So I have to, you know, tip my hat to you with regard to that. You know, I know it was only recently until I just, you know, uh, learned what they were and then uh, certainly decided to, you know, put one out there about applied you know, behavior analysis and, uh, and things like that. But anywho, um, but that's not what we're here to talk. We're not talking about podcasting history tonight. Um, we're talking about uh, your, uh, your, your uh, claim to fame, and that is uh, precision teaching, uh, standard acceleration charting, et cetera, and things like that. But before we get into that, uh, talk to us a little bit about how you got into behavior analysis. That's a good question. I started back in 1985 is when I graduated high school, and I immediately went to, well, I shouldn't say immediately, had the summer. I went to Youngstown State University, and there I met a professor named Steve Graff. And Steve Graff was a close associate of Ogden Lindsley. In fact, they were really great partners through much of their relationship. And there were, let's see, there was 
two other behavior analysts in that program, and it was eclectic. There were some cognitive folks. There's a psychodynamic guy, and you know, so it was a traditional psychology program. And what I found is of all the things that I was exposed to, I understood behavior analysis the best. And in fact, Steve Graff was good friends with Dick Malott, and Dick Malott was sending Steve Graff his second edition, and he's like, here, give this to your students and get some feedback. So I cut my teeth on that second edition, and that book was so refreshing. You know, it was just, it was humorous. Mm -hmm. It was well-written. And I said, you know what, this is something I want to spend my career with. And I asked my advisor, Steve, I said, hey, what should I do? He's like, you know, you, you want to go to Ohio State and work with this guy, John Cooper, because I was really into ABA, but I was also really into precision teaching. And John Cooper was a guy who was doing both those things. So I went to Ohio State, got my master's degree in special ed. I should say my undergrad was in psychology. I did say that. My undergrad was in psychology got my master's in special ed, and then you practice. So I spent three years working as a behavior analyst, special education teacher, and decided to go back and get my doctorate. So I went back and worked with uh, Coop again and graduated, and then here I am. I see. And so to, just for those who uh, aren't familiar with uh, what you're doing now, what is your, what is your real job today? Yeah, I am a professor of special education at Penn State University. Okay, cool. Um, so you mentioned precision teaching. Uh, so I, I think one of the things I like to do when we talk about a, a, a particular topic is just to get some basic definitions out of the way. You know, I, mm -hmm. I've got kind of like this probably character idea of what precision teaching is. And it's like, you know, doing stuff fast, right? You know, <laughs> there's probably a little bit more to it than that. So, um, so why don't you walk us through what precision teaching means to you and what are perhaps some of the defining characteristics of it? Precision teaching is a method. And what people need to understand is it's a method that lets you know if what you're doing is working. There's four steps to it. You learn how to pinpoint behavior. Skinner had a definition of behavior. Ogden Lindsley was his student and wanted to take Skinner's powerful contributions, especially in terms of measurement, and translate that so parents and teachers and students could use this tool. And he started off by teaching people how to pinpoint behavior, which is coming up with a very precise target of what you're measuring. After that, you count the behavior with what Skinner used, which was rate, but you could use other dimensional measures such as frequency and duration, or excuse me, duration and latency, or even count for that matter. And you take those carefully observed, counted, recorded behaviors, and then you put it on a standard view, a standard visual display, which is the standard celebration chart. And as we talk, I'll get into some reasons later why it's a powerful visual display, but you look at the data and then you decide, is what I'm doing working? Or isn't it working? And that process, those three things put together, helps you come to that conclusion very quickly. And that facilitates your decision making. So that's what precision teaching is. And there have been a lot of things that have been discovered through precision teaching with people now confuse those for precision teaching. For example, going fast. There's something called behavioral fluency, and there's quite a literature on that. that came about from all of these precision teachers back in the 70s who were timing behavior and they noticed relations between high frequency behavior. That's how fluency was born, but that fluency does not define precision teaching. Precision teaching are those four steps that I just mentioned. And there's a lot that's included in those steps, but to give everyone a basic understanding of what PT is, it's those four steps. Okay. Um, is it um, is it possible to do? And I'm just saying this perhaps out of you know uh, not knowing really how to use the chart all that great. Although I've I've looked at some of your uh, YouTube videos and they've been helpful. Um, and I'll include links to those in the show notes. But uh, can you have all those elements of precision teaching? 
but measure on a you know what we would call just a standard equal interval graph or a reg you know I'm using air quotes here uh, that the listeners of course can't see but uh, you know a regular graph that you'd see in Java or something else. The method of precision teaching is defined by taking your data and putting it on a standard acceleration chart. So if you did all the other steps and you just threw in a non-standard linear graph, you would not be doing precision teaching. You'd be doing some other good facets of measurement, but I would say the defining feature of this system would be that specialized chart. Would, I guess, um, would, would the learning outcomes be different? Yes. The visual display of the standard acceleration chart offers so many things that the non-standard linear graph doesn't offer that in, in cases you would come to very different conclusions about what your data are telling you. And that's not an opinion that I'm sharing with you. That's fact. I didn't invent the standard chart. It has been, well, let me take a step back. There are two types of graphs you can use. Linear graphs, which are the kinds you see in our journals, Java, JAB. And then there are ratio graphs. Some people call them semi-law graphs, but I prefer to use the term ratio graphs. And that family of, of graphs show behavior very differently than the linear graphs. And if you look at all the books that were written about this and articles, they talk about what those differences are. So there are very stark differences between the two. Now, there is a rule that if your data are within 10% of one another, you really wouldn't see a difference. And also, this is something else that everyone should know. If the data is going up on a linear graph, it's not like through some magic that it's going to go down on a standard acceleration chart. They're both visual displays. They're both time series visual displays showing you how is that behavior marching across time. But there are differences which would lead people to come to different conclusions when they look at their data. Okay. Uh, and, and so they would, they would maybe make different decisions about changing an intervention or, or what have you based on some visual analysis of, of those data. Yes. And the other nice thing about the chart, which is what we really don't practice this very well in our field, it not only offers visual analysis, it offers quantitative analysis. So if I said to you, hey, how valuable are numbers in terms of science? You would say math is the language of science. Nobody would argue with that. If you look at physics, if you look at chemistry, you look at any of the sciences that have been they're mature and have done very well, they quantify their subject matter. Because we use uh, the linear graph, we, we fall into, instead of, we just rely on visual analysis and we use words. Like uh, if we're going to talk about the trend, we would say things like, that's rapidly increasing. That's moderately increasing. That's gradually increasing. And the textbooks, all the textbooks will show you that we qualitatively estimate it. But when you use the standard acceleration chart, you can put hard numbers on these things that are very valuable. And that alone, I think, when behavior analysts start learning of those significant features with the chart, that's what attracts them to it. And then once they start using it and seeing that it's not the scary thing and it has all of this value that you don't otherwise have with the linear graphs, people start converting and they see that it's a device that helps them understand the world better. I see. Okay. Um, so what is, you know, I, I think, I think people who have been in say like elementary school classrooms and have seen kids doing it, uh, you know, math facts, you know, uh, you know, can probably get an idea of developing, as you described, behavioral fluency. Um, but one of the, you know, most of the listeners to my show 
uh, I'm going to go out on a limb, but I think it's it's fairly accurate. Uh, you know, provide services to you know kiddos with with autism, uh, usually either in home settings or in clinics or in schools. Um, you know, oftentimes not using it for uh, you know the, the, those um, those learning targets that we you know that kind of come to mind when you're thinking of a you know kind of a fluency based instructional program for for academic responding uh you know very often you know the the target behaviors are things like manding and tacting and you know social uh you know social responses and things like that um can you tell us a little bit about what's been done in the precision teaching area for you know kind of our or what what can precision teaching offer you know the kind of uh you know uh typical listener to this show who's maybe driving around their car and thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested about this, but, uh, you know, what, what is it, what is it going to offer me? You have, you mentioned two things in your question. One, what does precision teaching have to offer me if I'm working with uh, students with autism? And two, what does fluency have to offer me? And those are two very different questions. Everything that we do as humans, this is an axiom. This is part of living in the natural world. Everything we do occurs in time. You cannot argue with that. That is just the way the universe, well, I guess you can start talking about black holes and stuff like that. But the universe that we're dealing (laughs) with... I do do know you're a a science fiction fan, so... uh... (laughs) Yeah, so in our world... Time is incredibly important, and whenever we measure behavior, it's always in time. And by using precision teaching and saying, well, what does precision teaching have to offer me? What you'd be asking yourself is, how do, how do better pinpoints help me detect behavior? We have emerging research. There are some published articles out there, and there are more that are coming out that show if you look at a precision teaching target, it's more sensitive than when you compare that against an operational definition. That's one thing. Number two, if you are going to compare, let's say, a dimensional measure of behavior such as frequency, and you compare that against what's popular, some type of interval record, you're going to find that the interval the, the interval record is never as accurate as capturing that behavior in real time. And then when it comes to the chart, the standard acceleration chart offers distinct advantages over the linear graph. And those measures that you're detecting better, that you're counting better, and you're putting on this better display, all of that's going to lead you, no matter what you're working on, manding, tacting, whatever the, the thing that you're interested in, you will be able to determine the effectiveness of that thing that you're studying much more quickly than if you're not using this system. And of course, there's a fourth part of, which I don't think I even mentioned this, it's called try again, which means we never give up on the learner. Another way, a fancier way of, 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 determine, of calling this, I use this term called recursive problem solving, which means you're trying these strategies very systematically to help that learner overcome whatever plateau or sticking point that you've enc- you're encountered. So that's the answer for if I want to use precision teaching, in, that's going to help everybody. That should be, in, as far as I'm concerned, that should be part of the standard framework for all of behavior analysis. And I don't know that anyone would argue with what I'm putting forth here. I'm saying let's do the best we can to detect behavior. No one's going to argue with that. Let's use the best measures we can to capture behavior. Let's put that on a visual display that's going to show us what's happening with this learner. Is this a big thing or is it a little thing in terms of the magnitude of change? And let's not give up on those that learner. So those things are the part of precision teaching, which I think everyone can rally behind and would really like. Now, the fluency, I'll say this quickly. That is a, a procedure that many people are, when, when that behavioral fluency, I see so much variability to what it is. Some people do it as it's done within the precision teaching literature. Other people do these 
other things that they call behavioral fluency, but isn't something that the people who did the precision teaching and studied that would necessarily agree with. But that is a procedure that could be very helpful to people, nevertheless, if they're looking to grow a behavior. So um, what are you, you mentioned there's some studies coming out and some studies that have been done. Are, are there any that are uh, that occur to you off the top of your head? And I don't want to put you on the spot. So if you sure. have something at a different time, we can certainly put those in the show notes. But what, what are some what are some studies that listeners can go to to check out? One study that I could share with you, I want to say is 2013 or 2014, and it's an article by Dave Smith, and he, I, I can share that that study with you, and if you want to put it in your show notes or yep. you know put a give give it a PDF, that would be great. Yeah, we can do that easy. And piece. they looked at they looked at comparing these targets, which are active, actionable descriptions of behavior and comparing that to operational definitions. So that study, what they did is they compared these targets as precision teachers would use and they compared it against operational definitions and it was this young lady who was hitting her head and the term was she hits her head forcibly. And what they did in the study is they looked at how accurate are these people when they're given these different definitions of detecting the occurrence of the behavior? And the problem was, well, the numbers were something like maybe 69% accurate with this precision teaching target versus maybe 39% accurate when they're given the, the operational definition. And it turns out that the operational definitions would use adverbs like forcibly hit their head in it's very difficult to translate, well, what does that mean? What does forcibly hit one's head? And what this study showed is that words matter, and depending on how you choose to share what people should look at to detect that target behavior, it can certainly influence your ability to detect occurrences and non-occurrences of the behavior. So let me just back you up a second, because I'm, I'm might have missed something. So what was the alternative to operationally defining the self-injury? They didn't call it a pinpoint or a movement cycle, but that's essentially what they did. Or maybe they did. I can't remember since I read it. It's been a while. But the idea in, in precision teaching, when we talk about that thing called the, the pinpoint, there are two parts to it. So we're, I'll break down that pinpoint. One is called a movement cycle, which means you have an action verb and you have a target of that action. What's receiving that action? For example, hits arm. Hits is a very observable action verb. In arm is what's receiving that action. Writes word. Writes is an active verb and the word is the thing that is receiving that action. And you can count those very precisely because it's an action that has a beginning and an end. And using that is a very useful way of helping people understand exactly what they need to count. And that's what they used in this study. But I forget if they use that terminology or not. So if I'm understanding you correctly, they it sounds like they operationalize a definition except for the intensity dimension because that's always been a you know i mean certainly that, that that's always been a bugaboo right you know how what is forcibly like you said right what a what is hits hard those are always things that we all struggle with as as, as practitioners certainly so am, am i right is that basically what they did so it's basically hitting or or, or the contact of of hand to head or whatever the the issue was at the time yeah, think, with, think with, about it like this. There's a very specific formula for that movement cycle, whereas when you have an operational definition, that can have multiple components to it. It can be defining something. In an operational definition means what are the operations that define whatever I'm interested in. 
happiness, we can define that operationally. We can say, well, we're going to count the number of smiles that someone has. You know, but the operations by which we measure a thing is the definition. Now, it's questionable if counting smiles actually is a measure of counting happiness. So that's that's one of the issues, and there's a lot of other issues with operational definitions. But this particular formula is a way of showing people it. Like Skinner said, behavior is action. Behavior is people doing. And this formula is a way of giving people one target that is in this formula that helps them accurately detect what it is. When it all boils down to it, whether you have an operational definition or movement cycle, we're using our language, our verbal behavior, to help people know what they should observe. So both of them, you know, all of this lives in verbal behavior, but one, you can think about it as a formula that doesn't lead to the most accurate detection of behavior, where the other one, the data are showing us that it does. And I would also say that there, this has been in the precision teaching field for quite some time, but precision teaching teachers are notorious for the practitioners working and not publishing. So a lot of that data, while there is some, there's not enough data as there should be. But I'm, I'm starting to go off here a little bit, so let me pull that back <laughs> That's and okay. just make sure I've answered your question. Um, I think so. Uh, <laughs> um that's fine. It's uh, what we call long form interviews, so t tangents are uh, tangents are appreciated. Um, so, um, what are some of the other? I guess uh, you know. Is, is there another kind of seminal article uh, that that one can can check out that would be a good kind of primer on 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 uh, precision teaching? Sure, there are books, and so right now. This is going to sound a little self-serving, but I would say the best book is the one that I've recently co-authored with my colleague, uh, Kirsten Urich. And we, what we did is we read all of the texts on precision teaching. And in fact, our book, it, it came out, the first edition came out in 2012. And the last one before that was probably maybe the 80s or something like that. So there was this huge gap in terms of time. But there are some precision teaching books from the 70s and the 80s that show what was the current thinking at the time. And there's been a lot of research since then, a lot of, I mean, every science is dynamic and everything is changing. So what we have to offer in our text is the most current version. But there are some seminal pieces that are out there. Out there. Uh, there's this one, I'm looking at my bookshelf and there are like five or six authors, and I can't even remember who all. I think the first author is Kunzelman, and that was written in 1970. I would tell people that that is the, the, one of the best original primers of precision teaching, but now like, there's just so much that has evolved. So if people are interested, there are books out there that you can purchase. And there are also some good articles too that, that wouldn't necessarily be an investment of an entire book. I see. Okay. And uh, we'll certainly put those uh, links in the in the show notes as well for people to come check out. Well, all I'm doing is trying to think of things for people who are, you know, uh, who might be getting excited about this stuff so that, that, that they've got, um, you know, some resources to look at when they, uh, once they uh, get out of their car, or get home or finish walking the dog or, you know, whatever they happen to be doing. Um, when they're listening to the show, um, did, and again, I'm, I'm so, so not a student of this particular aspect of behavior analysis, but it, it if I'm just listening to you and just kind of just using that information, sounds like there was a lot of work done, you know, by, by Ogden and others, um, you know, perhaps in the, uh, you know, sixties and seventies and things like that. And it sounds, is it true that like, is there more, is it like a resurgence of precision teaching right now with kind of the interest that, that, you know, I mean, what was the, and I know you said that for a while there would, the publishing wasn't really encouraged. And I, I've read that too, in my preparation for the show, there was, you know, um, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, Lindsley himself who, you know, suggested that the, you know, practitioners just share their their findings at, at at meetings and conferences and things like that, and not necessarily publish in journals. Um, and certainly, I think when you and I spoke a while back, we also talked about um, 
especially the standard acceleration charts, not, you know, certainly are, are you don't find those in, in the journals that uh, we as behavior analysts typically consume. So um, is, is that assumption correct? Did it go into some black hole for a while where there was this kind of select few and now it's kind of uh, cu- coming out in a, I don't want to, I don't think renaissance may be too strong of a word uh, possibly, but can you, can you just talk about the evolution of it in, in a more general sure. sense? The Ogden Lindsley was a very prolific writer and I think I have him on tape, audio tape saying this. When I was at Ohio State, I think they still do this tradition. I'm almost No, I know they do this tradition still. They have this thing called teleconference. I did my master's degree there, as I mentioned, and my doctorate. And I was privileged to be able to attend that class multiple times. And they would interview major people in the field. And they interviewed Ogden Lindsley. And in that audio tape, I recall him talking about grants in being very turned off by grants because what he observed is you get the money, you discover something great, and then when the grant funding dries up, everything goes away. And so he, he soured on grants, and he, and he said that. The other thing, and I can't remember if that, that he talked about this or this was in an interview, but in terms of publications, he noted that publications take a while to come out, and there's limited people reading those publications. And his thought was, look, we need to help people as quickly as we can. And so chart parenting became this very interesting tradition where people would spend the time, invest in others, and they would teach them how to use the chart. And that would be a way to proliferate this practice. And that that had a very strong basis for helping precision teaching grow and expand. But like many things across time, many of the practitioners of precision teaching, like my advisor, for example, he retired, other people retired. And when people started leaving the field, there weren't enough students that were underneath them that came up to take their places. So you had that happening. And that, I think, affected how many people were researching precision teaching and writing about precision teaching. And there, there is wisdom in, in some of the things that, that Ogden uh, said at that time. And I, I think where he was going with that was a reaction to many of the experiences that he had in, in the publishing, uh, in academia. I mean, I, I understand that. I, I always joke with my colleagues and say there might be three or four people that have read some of my papers, and maybe that's being generous. You know, you're in a journal, and there's always this practice to research gap where there's research out there, but there's always a gap between our people, our people using it. And that debate's been around for for quite some time. But precision teaching, Because there weren't, there is a journal, there was a journal called the Journal of Precision Teaching, and it was, it was this weird kind of mixture between practitioner journals and some people doing more controlled research. And what happened when you had this, this motley uh, crew of people putting in one article could have some controls and then the other one was like, Hey, you know, I'm a teacher. I was working with my students and I just want to share this with you. And when you mix those things together, it was a little confusing to know what was the true identity of the the journal of precision teaching. So there, there are a lot of articles out there, many very good articles, but because it wasn't done for a long time. And because like when you look at Java and you look at, you know, their editorial board and, and all of the, what, what they kept is, as their standards, people would view those two journals very, very differently. And, you know, the precision teaching journal came about because it was very difficult to get people to publish the chart, which I understand the paper chart is this six cycle thing. It, it's eight, eight, you know, eight and a half by 11 takes up a lot of space so it was a challenge to get the articles in. But uh, that's the history of where it was. And there certainly is a very dramatic resurgence in precision teaching. And why is that happening? You, you can look at there are a number of people 
in Ireland. Uh, there, are, there are great people over in uh, Wales who are doing amazing work. There are, there's a substantial number of people in the States doing work. There are people in Canada that are starting to do it. And you're seeing, and there's a lot of students now that are interested in this. And all of that is when you go to conferences, you can see people talking about it. There are a bunch of articles coming out in very solid journals that are showing this work. And if you ask me why that happened, I'm not exactly sure. I suspect the reason why it happened is because you have some people who now are putting out doctoral students. You have some people who are very influential in, in, in spurring people to do research. So there are, certainly is, if, if what you're picking up on is true. So there's that history and where we are now. And frankly, I'm quite excited to, to that resurgence and in, in where we're going. Do you think it, you'll... Do you think we'll see uh, precision teaching studies uh, with the chart and all in, in Java at some point or another? I, I think so. And I will hear some people in the past that will say, oh, you know, there's this bias in Java and, and they don't want to, you know, Java people are against the chart. And my take on that is – Maybe maybe someone once had a – if you've ever published things and you've ever gone through that process, when people send you their reviews back, some people don't take very kindly to, to the reviews and, and the way that you know those comments are made. And so some people may tend to perceive those as personal attacks and who knows what the evidence is out there. But what I suspect is the way precision teachers have done research – they may not have had the same controls that the Java reviewers are used to seeing. Therefore, that is probably one of the, the reasons why you don't see more articles in Java because like I've submitted my stuff to Java and I've submitted charts to Java. And uh, the one that I submitted was rejected and, and the reviewers made some good points. So I went off and just published that somewhere else. Recently, my uh, doctoral student and I, we just submitted an article to Java. And I feel you know, everything with reviewers and, and science, the way it works is you have to convince the reviewers that what you have is worthy of sharing. It has to be a good controlled study. And there has to be a reason for why the chart's there. So now when I write... I show the reviewers, look, I can't do my brand of science without the chart. So I feel good about uh, submitting that to Java, and I'll be real curious to see. So certainly, I think that we're going to start seeing more SCC journals in places like Java and other places where we haven't seen them a lot in the past. Where where are SCC articles or PT articles or whatever being published right now. So you mentioned the the journal of precision teaching is is defunct. Um, so everywhere, it's hard to give you one place and say, look here. Uh, people publish all over the place. There, I recently just read an article that was this very cool precision teaching slash behavioral fluency study that came out where they worked with nurses. And nurses have to do blood draws, and they use behavioral fluency and precision teaching to teach, to get those uh, nurses up to fluency very quickly. And that's in some uh, British medical journal, BMJ. I think that's what that stands for. And that's a pretty uh, high profile journal. So it's there. Uh, I, I saw some recent reviews in some autism journals that are very good. Uh, the, the European Journal of Behavior Analysis has published some articles. So they're really uh, all over the place. You can, you can find them. Uh, even Behavioral Interventions, I think, uh, has published some. Okay, cool. uh, Behavior Modification, there have been some in there. All right. So there's some, there's some areas where people can go check stuff out. So cool. Um, yes. Are there – I, 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 I've kind of, you know, in my preparation for this, I've kind of sprinkled in some – what am I considered devil's advocate questions? And um, are there places in which precision teaching is contraindicated? I would say no. And before people accuse me of being partial, 
The reason why I say no is for precision teaching not to work, you would, if you put your data on the chart and you make a decision, it's worked because it's just a measurement system. Across time, how effective are those decisions? Those are other questions that need to be asked. So if you pinpoint a behavior, if you record it and you put it on a chart and that helps you make a, a decision, then precision teaching by its very nature has just worked and because it's a measurement system. Mm -hmm. Again, what, what people say is well, they think about be, uh, behavioral fluency is defining precision teaching. And there are certainly are times where behavior fluency is a piece of how you would bring students to a certain outcome. But there are times when you have to do acquisition. You need to do your you know, discrete trial instruction. You need to do whatever your acquisition uh, strategies are. And starting off with someone doing behavioral fluency in, in certain circumstances would certainly not be the right way to go. And, and you could find places where if you're going to start off doing fluency with someone who really doesn't know it, that certainly could be con uh, contraindicated because the idea with behavioral fluency is you're doing something called frequency building. Frequency building is defined as timed repetition and then giving people performance feedback when that time trial ends. If I'm working with someone that doesn't know something and all of a sudden I try to get them doing time trials, that could be a very problematic effort or intervention because you're asking them to go fast before you've ever established the foundation yeah, of what can, they need to know. It's a good way to get hit, I think, also, probably, <laughs> depending yeah, on the circumstances. exactly. You know, the, the, you know we, I've got a whole host of listener questions, and, and I think that um, kind of answered the question I was going to ask later from from uh, from Jackie, and she currently uses uh, the standard acceleration chart and Chartlytics, and we can get into what that is later. Uh, she said she loves it, but she was wondering, you know, about um, you know building skills versus doing fluency and things like that. So I think you 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 pretty much got at that. We can perhaps come back to that later if if need be. But I just want to give Jackie a little shout out for uh, participating in the listener question. Uh, segment um and we'll get back to other listener questions in a minute um so so we're talking about this chart um and this is such the wrong medium <laughs> we're talking about it uh, i know it. we're talking <laughs> visual stuff and right. we're talking so uh you know and i was gonna say close your eyes and imagine but i also think that most people could be <laughs> driving so you know don't do that um so with those caveats in mind or limitations in mind, um, you know, tell us about the chart in more detail. And again, this is where I get really, you know, kind of uh, this is where I don't have, um, a, you know, a lot of background in uh, other than what I've mentioned already. So, um, yeah. So just what are some, you know, I guess for the lack, since we don't have anything visual to go by, what are what are some terms people should know? about the chart itself that could help them when they go to say like um you know either your website or I'll I'll post a I'll post a chart uh, you know in the show notes here you know so they can go to that and okay okay I can then they can start placing things on the chart and saying okay this makes sense so what are some basic terms that can familiarize people with that alternatively if there's a better way to go about that you know explaining that you know go right ahead that's a great question there are it's mission impossible, here, but uh, I, I think you could do it. <laughs> let me say why I think many people are first when they come to the chart, what contributes to what I like to call chart shock. Chart <laughs> shock is the open mouth look, the eyes glaze over, like what the heck is this thing? It is a ratio chart, which means the way it's scaled is a uh, like linear graph, which everyone's familiar with. The way, if you go up and down on the vertical axis, it goes in equal intervals. One to two, three to four, all of those are gonna have the same space visually that will correspond to the amount of change. So one to two is gonna be allotted the same space as 20 to 21. On the ratio chart, it is scaled very differently. It's scaled proportionally, 
and one to two is nowhere near the same distance as 20 to 21. One to two is a 100% increase. When you go from one to two, one times two, that's anything times two is a 100% increase. So on the chart, the distance is allocated by proportional change. So what you will see is one to two, that distance is gonna look the same as 20 to 40, because 20 to 40, 20 times two equals 40, or 100 to 200. And that throws people because they're not used to seeing behavior in that proportional view. But the beauty of that proportional view is it allows you to see rate of change. Okay, so let me just, can I, can I just stop you there yeah. for a second? So sure. I'm gonna put my kind of newbie you know, interpretation on this, and, and I want you to tell me if I've got it or not. So when you're looking at the chart, there's a lot of horizontal lines, and yes. the, the gap between one and two is huge, and right. the, and 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 they get progressively smaller as you go up, right? And then right. it starts again with a big gap. Yeah, between, exactly. So like a hundred cycle. And, yeah, um, and then they get progressively smaller, and 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 so on. It goes up what five or six times or something like that, right? There's six cycles on the paper chart. Yep. Okay. All right. So I just so I just wanted to kind of make sure I had that. Uh, peace in mind and for those who are, are new to it so like there's there's big gaps followed by smaller progressively smaller and smaller gaps in uh was it factors of 10 yeah so one cycle is from one to ten mm -hmm. all right cool go right ahead sorry i interrupt so the uh that proportional change really matters when we look at behavior change we need to understand that going from one to two and going from 20 to 21, it's not the same thing. In terms of percentage of change, if you go from one to two, that is, like I said, that's a 100% change. But when you go from 20 to 21, that is, what does that change? That's like a, a much smaller percent. That's like, what, 9% change or, or no? No, no, no. That's not 9% change. That would be like 5% uh, change yeah. or something like that. Really small. And I, I, I took the history of math in college, so you're, you're talking to the wrong person. So. <laughs> Great. So you can call me out on my math when I, when I fumble with it. <laughs> the, what matters to us, if you're working with, let's say you're working with kids and you want to understand the magnitude of difference. If you have someone that has one tact and now all of a sudden they have two, how big of a deal is that? It's, like, it's I'm important. Asking you. Yeah, I mean, it's better if than you one. One and now you have two. I mean, you have kids, right? Sure. When you when your children were young and they had one word, how noticeable was it when they had two words? Oh, it was significant. Yes. It's huge. It's huge. And so that distance from one to two shows us that that's a 100% change. Really big deal. But now, if your kids had 20 words and they had 21 words, you'd really have to understand their stock of words to, to notice that difference. Here, let's just move that up a notch. What if your kids had 500 words and now they have 500 words? Would you even notice? Would you even be able to detect that? You wouldn't. Right. And on the chart, visually, if you had 500 and 501, it would look like it's the exact same dot because it's in one of those spaces that are really small. Because going from 500 to 501, that's not even a, a 1%. I don't know what the math on that is. It's a rounding it's really error. really a small – yeah, it's a small number. And this is what we as behavior analysts must embrace. Because we're using linear graphs – the distance from you know, 1 to 2, 500 to 501, they're going to look the same, and we're going to allocate that that is the same amount of change. It is incredible. It is just so way not the same amount of change. And because we wrap our whole world around this linear thinking, and we just have this very skewed way of understanding what are significant changes. And that is what I hope our whole field would embrace. I have this dream that we are going to elevate our science in terms of measurement. And when we can embrace the standard acceleration chart, that's what's going to happen. 
And I am just so encouraged because, you know, what I'm talking to you about here is, you know, I have these weird nerd fantasies. And when I think about like the great people, the, the great people you've interviewed that aren't standard acceleration charts, what would they discover if they were looking at the world through the, this lens of this beautiful math that's showing them a very different picture than what they're getting from the linear graph? So that the standard acceleration chart, your your uh, listeners, when they come across it, that's going to take some getting used to. But once they get that, it's no big deal. The second part that I would say that's kind of a big deal is the the paper chart has what's called a dual axis. On the one side, you have numbers, but on the other side, you have time because this chart is meant to show behavior that if it happens one in 24 hours, you can put it on that chart. But if it happens a thousand times in a minute, it can happen on the chart. And the only way that can happen is if you have these dual axes and almost everybody has no experience with dual axes and that really throws people. So it takes a lot of time to explain that concept and to show them with the paper chart how to use it. So I think, and again, this is a, a point in which I would recommend people check out your YouTube channel because uh, I, I did watch a couple of those videos and you, you patiently go through and you know kind of zoom in in certain areas and say, this is what we're doing here and this is why, and you zoom out and you go over to the other axis and stuff like that. So um, that will be a visual medium that uh, that you guys as the listeners can check out and uh, uh, you know kind of perhaps put some of these pieces together. But I do think that that magnitude of change argument is, is certainly compelling uh, and you know especially, when we're looking at, uh, you know, trying to figure out what, a, you know, a kid's tact remand repertoire is, you're, you know, it does make a lot of sense that, you know, going from one to two or, is huge. And, you know, some of those, uh, count, you know, uh, uh, other examples, again, are probably more rounding errors than anything else. So um, what, um, let's see, Wh what about measuring behavior uh, that is kind of continuous in nature, you know? And so if you have someone who is doing some, you know, uh, either uh, you know, physical or vocal, you know, stereotypic responding and things like that, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you know, many times you see those being measured, you know, through various types of sampling procedures. Uh, I'm thinking of momentary time sampling as, as perhaps one of the more common ones. Um what uh, are, are those are those types of uh, you know I guess non discrete I, for lack of a better word <laughs> are those amenable to uh, measurement using the the standard acceleration chart? I have pretty strong opinions on interval sampling. In my opinion, when people ask me if they should use them, my answer is don't. I feel that intervals. Interval. This is no. Let's move away from my feelings. Let's look at the literature and people that have actually studied this. Every single time you use interval sampling, this is the truth of it. You are going to underestimate or overestimate your behavior. That's not me saying it. That's just fact. I mean, how could it not do that? Unless you capture the behavior in time and you're doing a dimensional measure, a continuous measure, it's either going to underestimate or overestimate it. I mean, you could get lucky where uh, it just so happened to fall in there. But my take is if we are very serious about trying to understand what's happening with our clients, we can't be the, – the interval recording is going to tell us something. It's not like it's not going to tell us anything, but it can mislead us. And there are a number of very good literature reviews on it that show the problems that you have with interval sampling. And to me – like people will say, well, here's the problem. I can't do it because it's high frequency or I can't do it because of it's this. All of those arguments, there are ways to deal with that. If you have a behavior that, for example, let's say you have something that's happening, uh, a high frequency behavior. How do you deal with a high frequency behavior? A lot of people that I see out there, the one of the reasons why that's a problem is because some people will collect data all day. Like they do these six hour, like the, the kids will come to school and they're counting behavior all day. That's just way too much data. You can shrink down your time and you can have continuous recorded data, but you're not doing a complete record. You're doing, you know, a sample. And if you have high quality data 
that's going to tell you more about what's happening than if you're doing interval recording and you're getting a lot of noise in there. So I am not a proponent of interval sampling because uh, the measurement science that I'm advocating for is going to be as close to what that person is doing in the real world and in nature as possible. So those are the things that I advocate for. So just to kind of make sure I'm on the same page with you, you'd rather take data for a shorter period of time and focus on more ac what, what you feel are more accurate methods of data collection. And, it, and when you think about it, I'm, I don't know that uh, if you were going to compare the time samples I'm talking about, that they're, that they're not that much different. When you do interval sampling, how long are those interval samples for? Three minutes, five minutes? It's just the question of, should you do discontinuous measurement, excuse me, it's observation. Are you doing continuous observation or discontinuous observation? When you are doing sampling procedures, that's a discontinuous observation. You're not capturing the full range of what's happening. Uh, I would also recommend your listeners, if they would like a, a full-bodied explanation of this, uh, in the Johnson and Pennypacker text, they really talk about the pros and cons of doing it. And of course, what I'm saying to you is, I don't, well, I don't know that they would say don't do it, but they certainly lay out the pros and cons of it. And when you compare the two, there are more costs to doing it, I feel, than not. Again, it tells you something. It's not as if you can't learn things, but in when, when I want to do my business and I want to help students as quickly as I can, there's just too many advantages to continuous observation compared to discontinuous observation. Well, I know Jim is working on the, uh, the fourth edition, so it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what the take is when that comes out. So um, let's see here. All right. So let's jump into some more listener questions here. Um, all right. Here we go. Um, and thank you guys for, for taking the time to write in. So I've got a, uh, I've got a question from, uh, a, a former mentee, a supervisee of yours, uh, Dr. Mary Lynch Barbera, who's also been on the podcast ah, before. Yes. Uh, and, uh, so she says, uh, let's see, uh, question for Rick, who, by the way, is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, Oh, if, thank you, Mary. If a staff member or parent has no knowledge of fluency or the standard acceleration chart, do you have advice or a sequence of activities slash steps to get them to learn the importance of fluency uh, and the SAC without being overwhelmed? So, you know, I guess uh, the, the short version of how do you avoid that chart shock? I like that term chart shock. Uh, <laughs> so what, 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 what are your thoughts on that? That is a really good question. If... I don't know that there's an easy way to do it other than trying to communicate in ways that parents would understand. When you talk about, so again, I think Mary is doing a great job of understanding there's two parts to the science. There's the precision teaching, the measurement platform, and then there's also the behavioral fluency. When you talk about the behavioral fluency, that's always easier to talk about because everyone understands fluency in general. That's, you know, we're just talking in you know, common parlance. We say, hey, that person really is a fluent typist. People get that. The person's very smooth and automatic and doing whatever that skill is at this very good pace, but yet there are not many errors that are occurring and it's, it's flowing. Though that's a very nice way of explaining it, and then you tell them what the benefits are. You don't need to get technical. That works. And the way I would explain the, the precision teaching process is, again, I would break it down into those four steps that I said. Look, we want to make sure that we have really good targets. So when we're measuring your child's behavior, we know that that's gonna, that target is the thing that we want to measure. We're going to pick these different measures that are going to tell us a lot about what's going on with your child. Then we're going to use this, this graph, this, this chart, this visual display that is built to show us what effects are, are we, are, are, is the intervention having? And of course, 
the the last thing is we're not going to give up on you, child. If if that intervention doesn't work, we're going to try something different. So if you approach it that way, you have a really good communication channel with the parent. They'll get it. What I what I find, and this is this is a problem. There was a time there where I was entering into debates with people because I'm trying to do every single thing I can to get people to move off of the non-standard linear graph for time series behavior onto the standard acceleration chart. And if, if we had a lot of time, I like I have a paper that I'm working on where I'm going to show here are three facts why everyone should be doing that. But that chart can be very complicated if you really go down the rabbit hole and you want to look at all of the incredible things that it can do for you. And when I was in these debates, one of the questions uh, came up, which was, uh, should, what, what should we, uh, or what was, how, how was the question? It was something like, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of the, the, the standard acceleration chart and linear graphs? And this person said, well, I can explain the linear graph parents much more easily and they'll never understand the chart. I, I've, and my heard response, the, I've, I've heard that before many times. Yeah. And here's my response. It is not our job to explain the standard acceleration chart to the students. If you have a child, I have three kids. If my children, let's say, had some uh, problem with their brain and they had to have um, in uh I'm blanking on the, the acronym. It's not the EKG. That's the heart. It's the uh, EEG. E yeah, uh, the encephalogram yeah. or the whatever that. Uh, I don't know why I'm blocking on the term, but that is very complicated. So are you going to tell the doctor? You know, or, well, we're going to go with the EKG. Same thing. Does the doctor have to explain to me what the EKG is? That I. That's the tool that they use to understand how well my child is doing. That doctor has no, they don't have to tell me. That's not their job. Their job is to fix my child. And they don't have to spend an hour telling me all the nuances of the EKG. So why do we have to do that? Our job is to change behavior. So when people try to say, oh, well, parents wouldn't understand it. Our job is to fix behavior. Our job is not to launch into an hour discussion showing them all the finer points of acceleration. So I find that argument very specious, well, and it's one that detracts from the real issue. It's this incredibly powerful tool. It's going to allow us to be much more efficient, and saying that parents won't understand it is just not an argument that I would ever support. Well, what if you were doing parent training, though, and the parents needed to collect yep. data? Uh, what, what would be... You know, I, I, so do parents need to collect data, or do they need to collect and graph it? Right. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that go go in here. Okay. Or is the parent going to be the decision maker? I mean, if you're going to set up some kind of study where you wanted to say, can we teach parents to use? Can we teach them to measure the behavior, put it on a chart, and make their own decisions? If you were running that kind of study, then you certainly would have to teach the chart to them. But if you want to include your parent, and the parent is recording data you can easily share that with a behavior analyst who can who can put it on the the chart so and they, then we train the parents to collect the raw data and we would take the data ex and yes chart. Okay. exactly cool and i'll say this too the chart can be done in 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 it can be presented in a way that is no more complicated than a linear graph if parents understand the relationship that dots going up are good they're going to get the same relationship on the standard acceleration chart. It's a time series display, but it just has all of these other features that the non-standard linear graph doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a big advocate for it. Cool. Uh, Karen, uh, Karen White Reed says, what is the best easy to read starting point book or article you would recommend to interns to get their buy-in on the concept of precision teaching. Well, I think you answered this earlier, and, and uh, so you were you were uh, modest. So go ahead and tell us what, what is the exact title of the book, and who is the co-author again? It's the Precision Teaching Book, and it's my myself and Kirsten Urich. I, I don't know that I would recommend that book. And so Karen asked a good question. I wouldn't. That book has 400 pages. That's not a way to win hearts and minds to plop that into <laughs> an intern's lap. 
I would give the intern, uh, there are some videos out there. There are uh, some articles that are easier, you know, easier to digest and read, but you know, how much can any one article really fire someone up and, and you know, send them off to, to, oh yeah, this is the thing that I want to do. I mean, it's, it's a good question. And I think the, the way you get people interested in something is you show them how to use that device and you show them what it does for them. And then when they see that they're accomplishing these outcomes, then they, they won't want to live their life without it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you, you, you let the, uh, the reinforcement, uh, go Absolutely. from there. Yeah. So, uh, Adrian Fitzer writes, uh, uh, why switch over? My students are making progress using the same old percent correct. Seems like a ton of work and training for a minimal ROI. Now, mind you, I, I know Adrian, and um, <laughs> she put that in quotes, and she's saying that that's a common uh, uh, response that she gets. So that's not her feeling. I, I don't think uh, specifically sure. she's she's echoing something that she hears quite a bit uh, in her day to day. So, yeah. Um, but I thought it was okay, kind of funny the way she wrote that. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Let me deal with the premise of that question. The premise is that the she's saying that look, I am getting uh, enough data, you know, to to do my job, and then why should I do all these extra steps, so to speak? Why should I learn all this other information? We did a study. We've done two studies now, and this in this study we looked at. Uh, over 4,400 graphs, well, approximately that's how many we looked at. And these are from from studies like Java, from JAB, BMOD, all of our great journals. And we looked for construction error because there are rules that say this is how you should make your graphs. I didn't make up those rules. I was just looking at these rules and seeing how well do people graph. And what we found through our study is that it's – an 85% construction error rate. That means you can open up Java right now, you can up JAB, and about nine out of 10 of their articles in there are gonna have construction errors. It is, so So back to her question, are you following those specific guidelines? Because if you're not, what can happen is you can be making decisions and think you're doing the right thing, but really your decisions can be greatly compromised. You wouldn't even know that, and you wouldn't even be doing this intentionally because these rules, and, and the biggest violation, by the way, if people are saying, well, how would that possibly be true? There is a rule called the proportional construction rule, which, and this is in the white book, so this isn't, again, uh, I don't know how many people look at, at that chapter in, in the book, when it comes to that, but it says graphs need to be between five eighths up to three fourths. The vertical axis needs to be a proportion of up to five eighths to three fourths of the horizontal axis. And what happens is many people, their vertical axis is either way too big or way too small. And when you do that, your slope is changing. It's either being depressed or it's being exaggerated. And if it's depressed, you may be making decisions to, wow, this program really isn't working, so I'm gonna make some changes, when in fact you didn't need to do that, or the opposite. Uh, we, we need more studies that show that, and there's a, so that's, that's one part of it. So the actual tools that many people are using now can be compromised without them even knowing it. The second part is this. There are, if you want to elevate your measurement science, number one, you have quantification. How valuable is that? So you're using percentage data and you're putting it on a linear graph, a non-standard linear graph. Do you have acceleration? Do you actually have a measure of change that tells you how fast your child or your client is moving? I mean, how valuable is that? What's the ROI? The ROI is I now know this thing that I did produces this rate of learning. I, if you think about how valuable is that in medical science, if you have, if you're sick, what are you going to ask the doctor if the doctor gives you something? Hey, how long is this going to take? We can't even do that in our field because number one, our graphs 
we, we use sessions uh, almost there's such so many people using sessions along the horizontal axis and number two uh, we're not measuring that acceleration there's one ROI I could go down the path and tell you about variability when you look at variability we call it balance and precision teaching what if I told you you could put a number on variability and the wider it is that those numbers tell you how much control your intervention has in terms of ROI would you rather not have that information or would you rather actually put a number and know how much control is your intervention exerting those are just two things that I can say and I would think that that would convince most anybody because the counter argument to that is well these numbers don't matter and that you couldn't make an argument that numbers don't matter. And I'll give you, I'll just say one more thing. The chart is standard. That means every single person that's looking at it is they're going to have the same view. They're looking at this lens that's not changing. So that EKG, if you look across the United States and across the world and everyone that uses it, they can quickly detect the pattern. And if she were using this, she'd be able to detect patterns very quickly. So the ROI is so high, and this is why I get so fired up about the standard acceleration chart. All of us, we can have this. So all of your listeners who are listening to this, you can have this tomorrow. And there's really no, uh, all you have to do is, what am I suggesting here? Use a better visual analysis tool. Measure your behavior a little bit differently. And you know, that's not, I'm not telling people to not use reinforcement. I'm not saying use this particular behavior for teaching verbal behavior. I'm not even talking anything about that. I'm just saying if you have better measurement tools, you will understand the world better and your ROI will be times 10 than what you're, um, than what you have now. All right, cool. Um, I, I, detect a little passion in this topic here so <laughs> yeah if you want to push my buttons you're asking the right questions yeah, that's right um all right uh, uh dr becca tag um fellow podcaster uh she says we use electronic data collection any recommendations or, or suggestions on how to make the standard acceleration chart compatible with these plat platforms i am a big fan of the s uh cc and also of the electronic data collection systems. It would be great if something was in the works to combine the two. Yeah, good question. Through the history of precision teaching, there have been a number of people that have tried to move it off of the paper medium, which is, that's an industrial revolution. If you're using paper, you are literally using industrial revolution tools. And we live in the digital age now. So how, people have noted that and they've tried to move it. So some of the earliest efforts, well, actually back in the Apple II, I, some people tried to, to do the chart. And I don't know how well that worked. But there have been Excel files. There have been these uh, stat view files. I mean, stat view isn't even around anymore. There have been uh, s different people who have come up with digital charting. And in fact, this is something that I have personally undertook. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you talked about Chartlytics. That is a company that I co-founded. And we, we co-founded this com company because we realized the, the paper chart is, there's such a response cost to learning it. And it's very difficult to do a lot of the things that we need to do in the digital age so this company was, you know, we, we did this so that we could help provide people these tools if they're interested in that. But right now, there are options. There are Excel charts out there for free that, that give people the chart. There, I don't know what other platforms there are. I think there's, uh, Chuck Merbitz had this thing called AIM chart, I think was his term. And, and I think that's still out there but I haven't played with that in a while. So there, there are different ways of, of doing it in, in exploring digital media that make the chart just so much easier. Okay, and that, that uh, reference for Chartlytics is uh, chartlytics.com, right? Yes. Um, all right, cool. And I'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well. It's, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, Damian Murtaugh, um, and Damien, I'm hoping saying I'm saying your last name correctly. Um, let's see. I'd like to ask Rick Cabina, what do you think can be done to make acceleration charting and precision teaching more widely known 
and used by behavior analysts now that there's nothing tying them to the to the task list. Yeah. Because okay. Because just you yeah, asked just, me another just, another, <laughs> just, another button pushing question. So just before you answer, I, I uh, so you know as as longtime listeners of the show know, I I took the test a long time ago, and there was. Uh, uh, as many know, uh, questions about the acceleration chart on it. And I remember preparing for the exam, and it was just kind of a, you know, kind of an ignorant confession here, just learning enough of the terms to narrow down the guessing. <laughs> so, sure. You know, so my wild stabs in the air would be slightly less wild. So, uh, yeah, so even when it was on the test, Damien, um, many of us were not necessarily learning the chart. We were learning, you know, we're we're trying to maximize our our efforts in other areas of the exam so we could you know um but anyway um uh, i digress go ahead so with the the BACB in their exam many people will say well since it's not the the BACB and these folks that have come up with the exam since they say it's not on the chart it couldn't possibly be valuable right that's the message that is is implicitly out there, or at least that's what some people will interpret that to mean, that because it's not on this thing that I'm getting certified with, it can't possibly hold any value. And that is, is just a, is simply not true. And for whatever reason why the chart is, which I won't go into the reasons why it's come off, but the how, how do we get people to the question was how do we get people to value it since it's not on on the task list anymore right that's the question yeah. yep. the or how to get more widely known but yeah how do we get people yeah. using it essentially uh, given that it's not on the task list yeah so th going back to this is um i want to say this to all your listeners and and i hope that you always all of you I'm talking to you directly as you're walking or doing whatever you're doing. Realize that we really have a baby science. If you look at when we were founded and where we are, we are babies. We're just, we just, we're a blip. If you look at how long physics has been around and how they're a mature science, and you compare their time frame to how long we've been around, we're just we're infants. We just were born and we're you know, we're in the world and we have a lot of growing to do. And with that being the case, there is so much for us to learn. When I did that study, you know, I'm the first one to do that study. There were zero studies where people actually looked at how well are we making graphs and ask yourself, well, why is that the case? Why don't we, if, if visual analysis is the primary way we do our business, why hasn't everyone look to see if we're actually making our graphs right. I mean, just think about that for a moment. And if you if you follow down the path of reasoning and in, in where I'm going with this is because we're so young, you know, we, like we, so where does this come from? When Skinner did his work, he used a standard view. Every one of his contemporaries used a standard view. It was called a cumulative record. So just like the EKG, when you saw a distinctive pattern, people could replicate it in their labs and they instantly knew what that was. They instantly knew what it was because it was a standard view. It wasn't changing. That was very powerful. But when the applied behavior analysts, when they leaped from the lab into people just started using non-standard linear graphs. So everyone would make up their own graphs and there hasn't been a lot of scrutiny on where that is. So now everybody just assumes that when people make graphs, it, they're fine. And they're, they're, they really don't require a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of scrutiny. I use that word twice. So with put, Putting these two ideas together, us being a baby science and us you know, not looking at what's the best way for us to do our visual analysis and can we do quantitative analysis together, when we start doing more studies, and this is what I'm doing personally, I realize that we have a field where people are driven by data. Again, one of the beauties of our field, and there is certainly a kinship that we all share. We all have fundamental beliefs that we all share. And one of them is that data is the king. And I know for a fact 
that when people start looking very closely at the differences between what does a linear graph give you and what does a standard cell ratio give you, uh, reasonable people are just going to see that, wow, I never knew this. It's just like what you, you, know, you were telling me, Matt. You weren't exposed to this. Uh, there was a question that I read that uh, you know one of the, the, the I thought you were going to ask me, which was, well, why don't uh, you know Jabba review? You know, if it's so good, why don't Jabba reviewers use this? And how many Jabba reviewers actually know anything about this? I would submit to you that, like you, everyone just hardly knows anything about this because it's so unknown. And that's, you know, again, I won't get into why that's the case. There are people that know it, but in terms of how many people we have and how many people know about it, it it's very few. So get that question was a very good one. How does this become popular? People need to use it. They need to understand what it can do for them. And then when they see that value, then I won't have to be, you know, right now I am trying to impact people and impress upon people the the power of this through through what I've learned and through what the data is. But when you start doing it and you start making decisions more quickly, when we start making there are new discoveries that we could make when we elevate our measurement platform. For example, uh, there's something called effect sizes, which is a statistical procedure. What if I told you we could have our own effect size? just based off of one client, just based off of the standard acceleration chart. How valuable would that be for you? There are all of these amazing things that we can discover that are waiting for us out there, but we need to start exploring this other thing. And I am confident that if people learn what the standard acceleration chart could do, then you know the answer to that question is people are just going to use it because they extract value. And because very few people know about it and there aren't many reasons compelling them to use this, you have people that, you know, it's just like this weird cousin over there that, you know, <laughs> shows up at your reunions and like, hey, how are you? And uh, that's going to change. And I know it's going to change because we are a science that is driven by data. And as myself and my colleagues start producing data, People will see that. People will start using it, and and that is what's so encouraging about our field. So let me ask we, you that we live. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So let me ask. Oh, you no, that... I'll, I'll keep rambling. <laughs> no, Go it's ahead. good stuff. I, I, um, so what are what you know? You mentioned you mentioned research and things like that. Um, what are some important research questions that that are out there? You know, especially from the standpoint of, say, someone, in, you know, uh, a graduate student who's looking for a project, you know, as, as I like to tell people, you know, <laughs> I have this friend who's been all but dissertation uh, for, yeah. for many years. Uh, and this friend of mine um, <laughs> doesn't want to start on his dissertation uh, until he can find a topic that is, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, of course, you know, but uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so uh, I'll stop kidding around, but basically, you know, if, if there is a, you know, what, what's some low hanging fruit? I guess I'll just kind of cut to the chase in terms of, of, of doable research questions that are out there as it relates to this measurement tool. Wow. It is so wide open right now that if you just look at uh, doing even descriptive studies, like how fast do students learn certain things? Uh, just by that measurement platform alone, there are so many questions that we have yet to have answered. There are, if, you, if you're doing a traditional single case design, just by putting that on the chart, you, there's all of these incredible statistics, these numbers that will teach us things that because no one has done this yet, just explaining to people, oh, uh, this is how fast you were here, this is how fast you were when we did this. There are even numbers that calculate the speed change from one condition to the next condition. Those would be incredible contributions because we don't know. We have, we've lived our whole life without using these numbers. What happens when we start looking at quantifying these numbers? It's gonna be amazing, the, the things that we start discovering. There's, it's it's a great question. There's so much out there. You know, you could look at variability. You could look at acceleration. 
we have these other terms called, uh, there's this thing called the improvement index, which are these ratios of, of you know, correct accelerations and incorrect accelerations. There's all of these different things that we could discover through the measurement science that is going to help us better understand whatever that uh, you know, phenomenon that we're interested in looking at. Okay, so sounds like lots of stuff out there. So, and, and bear in mind, you know, um, as as you mentioned, as you're, you know, kind of conducting research and and have studies to talk about, you're always welcome to come back and and share additional thoughts on this. And I'm sure this topic is going to generate lots of follow up questions from um, from from folks. So, uh, before I let you go, I know you you've already d- dispensed a lot of great advice for for listeners and things like that. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Oh, that's a good question. Final thoughts. What I've been talking about this interview, in which I would encourage everybody to embrace, is the measurement science that we have, that we're developing, that had its roots in precision teaching. I think what will happen, like the standard acceleration chart, you don't need to do precision teaching to use the standard acceleration chart. If you, like the, the, the pinpointing, which is valuable, you know, if you weren't using pinpoints, just by taking data and putting it on a chart and ex- explore it, I think your audience measure, um, audience listeners shouldn't be afraid of that measurement platform. And if they will give it a shot, they will learn the things that I have been talking about and, you know, I guess that's that's where I would leave it. And there's a lot of people out. I won't say a lot. There are some people out there that will say things about the chart that are not grounded in reality. And if you've heard anything negative about the chart, just disregard that and come in with a, a clear verbal repertoire. I almost said clear mind. Clear verbal repertoire <laughs> and... Give it a shot. We're, see see how it works for you. There are resources out there. There's a Facebook page called Standard Acceleration Society. And join that. There is a wonderfully welcome group of people that will answer your questions. There's, if you're like, wow, I have this really rookie question, don't, don't even think about that. Just ask your questions. Ask for help. People will help you. And I would uh, put this out there too. My email is... Uh, rick at chartlytics.com. That's the one that I check very frequently. If you email me there, I would be more than happy uh, to share resources with you. To If you have questions like, hey, you know, how would I do this? Feel free to contact me because I, as an undergrad up until now, I have been just in love with our science and like you, like all the listeners, behavior analysis is a helping field. We go in this field because we want to help people live better lives. We want to engineer a better society. And the contribution of adding measurement science to the great things that you do is just going to help you do it all the faster and all the more. And I don't think I could you know, end the podcast on any more uh, you know, better advice than that. All right, cool. Well, we will leave it there, but uh, the door is always open to come back. And like I said, I'm sure the the uh, numerous questions from this, and we're also going to feature uh, other guests who will be talking about precision teaching and things like that as well. So this is uh, not going to go away with this episode, and uh, so we'll we'll continue uh, revisiting this topic from time to time. But uh, for, for, for this evening, Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, bye. Hey guys, thanks for checking out that interview. I know by the time we wrapped up, it was getting pretty late at night, and I appreciate Rick for his flexibility and being available, and I appreciate you guys for tolerating my sometimes misguided attempts at humor and so forth. Um, I also want to, again, let you know that if you're interested in learning more about precision teaching, check out our new sponsor, Chartlytics, at chartlytics.com, and if you want to check out that professional development package they have, 
uh, for listeners of the Behavioral Observations Podcast, head on over to chartlytics.com forward slash Matt. That's M-A-T-T. And as always, uh, if you want show notes, if you I've got a list of links and things like that to the th- stuff we talked about today, you can head on over to behavioralobservations.com and look for session 39. So... I think that's going to do it for today. This has been a long episode. I'm looking at the clock here, and we are well over an hour and a half. So thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you in session 40. So see you then. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast.